My sister is an urban legend. I never liked those growing up. Probably because of her. You ever notice how when someone tells an urban legend, it always starts out with something like, My brother's cousin had this girlfriend once who... Yeah, sure he did. I think that's why people find urban legends fun though. Nothing bad ever happens to someone you know personally, of course. But it's still someone connected to you. A friend of a friend of a friend. That makes it real enough to be fun, but not so real as to be horrifying or tragic. The thing is though, urban legends have to start somewhere. And your dumb stories might not be so fun for the people who suffered the truth. Most people don't even remember that I had an older sister, much less who my sister was. Her name was Michelle, but everyone called her Missy. She liked baking a lot. We used to make cupcakes together. That's the strongest memory I have of her. And I hold on to it when times are tough. When people are talking, running their mouths without thinking twice. She always lets me choose what colour sprinkles to use. Isn't that nice? She was really kind to me, for an older sister. Missy was a full 12 years older than me. I was only 6 when she died. Missy had this best friend C, Ava. Ava was nice too, and when she came over, she and Missy would let me play with them, at least for a bit. They never treated me like a nuisance. My memories of Ava are scarce. In my mind, I see flashes of black hair, and I can hear her laugh. She had this very distinct laugh, the kind that makes you happy just to hear. Anyway, Ava got sick when she was in high school. Leukemia. She was sick for a while, and then she died. I saw her once or twice in the hospital when she was still feeling okay. I wasn't allowed to see her at the very end though. But Missy went to see her every day. The day Ava died, Missy promised to keep seeing her every day, no matter what. And she kept her promise. After Ava's death, Missy used to drive to the cemetery every day after school. It was her senior year of high school, and she should have been out partying with friends, getting into all sorts of dumb trouble. But she wasn't. Instead, she spent every afternoon just sitting at Ava's grave. My parents encouraged it at first, but eventually, they grew worried. This isn't healthy, my mother told my father one night. They were whispering but not quietly enough. I suppose they hadn't realised I was hiding at the top of the stairs, hanging onto every word. It's not good for her. She's torturing herself over this. I think we should talk to her. My father was a man of few words, so each word he used was important. I knew that there would be no more daily cemetery visits once they'd talked to Missy, and that made me relieved. I too was worried about my precious big sister. Unfortunately, they never had the chance. That night, Missy was late coming home from the cemetery. My parents were worried enough when the knock came at the door. Missy never knocked. When we saw the police officer standing there, asking for Michelle Turner's parents, we all knew what had happened. The details came later. It was dark and slippery out. I remember that it was winter then, and ice was beginning to form on the roads. That was probably why my parents were so worried. Anyway, they think a deer ran in front of her old Ford, and that's why Missy swerved. She lost control and swerved the car into a ditch, just outside the cemetery. They assured us that it was an instant, and she didn't feel any pain. My parents buried Missy next to Ava. I begged them not to. At the time, 
I couldn't explain why exactly that felt wrong. Now I know. It's because she should be buried with us when the time comes. But my parents felt this was what Missy would want. Ava's family agreed. So that's where my sister is buried, next to her best friend in Sandwood Cemetery. Perhaps that's why the legend started. A few months after her death, long enough that the town wasn't in mourning anymore, my family and I started hearing the stories about the two dead girls in Sandwood, how their mysterious deaths could never be explained. People came up with all kinds of crazy ideas. In some versions of the story, Ava and Missy were lovers, torn apart by death, only to be reunited in the afterlife. In others, Ava was jealous that Missy was still alive and ran a car off the road so they could be even, which is both ridiculous and stupid. In all versions though, Missy didn't roll a car by mere accident or coincidence. It was Ava's ghost or the face of death itself that did it. Or, and this one pains me the most, she rolled the car because she wanted to. Because she wanted to die, and that was the only way to make it look like an accident. I hate that version, because out of all the stories, it's the only one that could be true. It was a full-blown urban legend by the time I hit high school. People were never careful around me, because they didn't realise Missy was my sister. People had long forgotten to include Missy's last name in the stories. Besides, we were 12 years apart. Most people just assumed Missy was an only child. But she wasn't. She was my sister. That's my sister people are talking about. It's a fun urban legend for most people. It's a terribly painful, terribly real memory for me. I never talked about Missy. I didn't want people asking me about the legends or bothering me with them. I simply avoided them or expressed disinterest if they were brought up. It was working pretty well until one day, near the beginning of my senior year, a couple of my friends, Sarah, Tom and Gregory, wanted to go out to Sandwood one night and begged me to join. They say if you go out when the moon is full, you can hear the sounds of the two girls laughing together, said Sarah in hushed tones. We were killing time in study hall, and I wanted nothing more than to escape that stupid conversation. I remember rolling my eyes a little at her. Really? Why is it always a full moon? Honestly, some people are so unoriginal. But then I thought about Ava again and a laugh, and I tried to think back to Missy's laugh, and what it sounded like, but the thing was, I couldn't, I just couldn't remember, I was stuck on that sudden revelation when Greg and Tom jumped on board Sarah's proposal, why not, it's a nice enough night for it, and it's not like we're going to get another chance, said Tom, Greg nodded and added, I'm blowing this asswipe town as soon as I graduate. Might as well take a good story from it, right? Greg thought he was such a badass. Real edgy. Sometimes it made me cringe, but I still liked him. I really should have said no. I should have told them I had homework or family night or something. There were a million excuses I could choose from. Because... I didn't want to make a mockery out of my sister's death, out of all the pain my family had been put through at her expense. But her laugh. I couldn't stop thinking about her laugh. And even though I knew I wouldn't hear it, knew the stories were bullcrap. Yeah, I'm in. I had to take the chance. Greg drove, 
His parents were loaded and let him borrow any one of their numerous cars whenever he wanted. He picked me up last around 10 o'clock. I told my parents I was going to a study group and I'd be back late. They trusted me. They thought I'd moved on as much as I could from Mrs. Death. They really overestimated me. We drove out to the cemetery and parked on the side of the road, windows down so as to better hear the ghostly laughter. Everyone cracked open a beer, except for Greg who didn't really drink. I think about Greg a lot nowadays. He was always pretending to be someone else. Not that it really matters now, I guess. We sat there drinking for a while, laughing and chatting about school. Sarah was practically bouncing in her seat from nervous anticipation as the night wore on. It was all great fun to them. A game. I was nervous too, but not the good kind of nervous. Instead, I had a vaguely sick feeling in my stomach, like something bad was about to happen. But I wasn't sure what. The feeling intensified around midnight. That's when we would hear the laughter, Sarah told me. Because that's when the veil separating life and death is lifted ever so slightly. That's when we can hear the dead. I didn't believe her. I waited for a sign from Missy since the day she died and never gotten one. I believe that dead is dead. No amount of wishing or hoping or sobbing in your bedroom while your parents drink themselves to sleep again will ever change that. I was musing on that when Sarah shushed us. Hey, listen, do you hear that? I thought she must be kidding. We all quieted down and listened. Outside, the wind rustled the leaves of the trees for a moment, just one sliver of a moment. I thought I heard someone walking through the grass. And then it was gone. Tom snorted at us as he chugged the rest of his beer. I don't hear any. That's all he got out when the screaming started. It was all around us, like we were caught in some kind of freak storm, shrieking and wailing, the likes of which I had never heard before in my life. It was like a portal to hell had been opened, and we were hearing the voices of the damned. It was the sound of pure agony, and it was so loud that it shook the car. No, wait, it wasn't shaking the car. Something else was. The car was rocking wildly back and forth, so hard that Sarah and I were bouncing on the seat. I hit my head against the top of the car and cringed, my vision blacking out for a second. I could hear the screams my friends join the voices outside as the car rocked violently. I was terrified for a moment that whatever was outside would shake the car hard enough that it would roll over. I took a second to think about that, about the car rolling, about my death, about what my parents would think when I died just like Missy had, when Tom's voice tore through the air. Roll the windows up! Jesus Christ, roll the windows up! My hand was on the window crank before I could even process what he'd said. I had the window up in seconds. Sarah, on the other hand, was curled up in a ball in the middle of the back seat, sobbing and rocking back and forth. I scrambled over her to close her window, trying to desperately hold my ground. The car was still rocking, back and forth, back and forth. A few seconds later, the engine roared to life and the screams outside increased in volume. For a moment, the shaking got worse and I was thrown to the floor. Then, Greg slammed on the gas, and we shot out into the night like the proverbial bat out of hell. I know, I know, cliche, but it's exactly how we felt. The shaking stopped, the screaming stopped, everything stopped, 
except for Tom and Greg swearing and Sarah's sobs. I was in the back seat, stunned and terrified, listening to the night wind as we left the cemetery in the dust. But just before we turned onto the main road, just before we left sight of the cemetery for good, I could have sworn I heard someone calling my name in the voice of someone who had been dead for 12 years. That night ended our friendship. It seemed like a big deal at the time, but looking back, most high school friendships are doomed to fade into obscurity. We would have drifted apart sooner or later anyway. It was just the fact that it happened so suddenly that made it hard to swallow. But maybe it was for the best. Our experience became a part of the legends. We didn't hear stories about mysterious laughter anymore. Instead, we heard stories about screaming and shaking and hell. I chose not to listen to them. I didn't want to anymore. I just wanted it all to go away. But things like that don't ever really go away, do they? It's been many, many years since I graduated and left my hometown. Many years since I've been to Sandwood and put flowers on my sister's grave, praying and hoping that I would wake up and everything would be one big nightmare. I don't have nightmares anymore. Nothing in my dreams can be worse than what I've seen awake. It's the 30th anniversary of my sister's death this year. My parents want me to come home for a death date. They want me to visit the cemetery with them. And I know I should. I know it's important to them. And it's my duty to them as their child. And yet, I find myself hesitating as the season draws to a close. As the snow begins to fall and ice begins to cover the roads. Because I'm terrified of the day when I return. I'm terrified of hearing my name whispered once again in the cold stillness of the cemetery, beckoning me to glance at what's on the other side 